she was doing Thursday. Yeah, and the lab, so the, welcome to thermodynamics. The lab is due the week after, at the next lab period. And watch the format. I did have, I was looking through, uh, somebody just turned in some papers without the memo. So they, like this time it was a memo format about basically a single page. And that's useful in uh, the real world because sometimes your boss asks you a question, you know, how do we do something? And then you come up with, here's, here, here's, here's my calculations. And he doesn't really want to know all your calculations other than his boss asked him a question, he's got to answer it. He wants a one page thing because he won't have time to read the second page. So you can summarize it on one page memo and then support all the numbers in that with stuff. So if he doesn't believe a number or his boss says that's not right, he can say, well, see, I'm just here. And the assumption is, blah, that it was a 10 minute shower, not a one hour shower, not a one minute shower, or whatever it is, you can see what you don't always, you usually have to make up some data, like the, you know, on your shower, it was how long is your shower, how warm is it? That's an assumption that has a bearing on what the final answer is. And you want to support that with stuff behind whatever your, your memo is. Uh, in the labs coming up, the, the uh, temperature one, we have pressure one this week. Um, in those labs, those are got full-on lab report as according to the, the, what that really means, a cover letter, and then there's a series of um, topics, introduction, why am I doing this, you know, maybe procedure, what's the data that you got, what are the results, the data is something that you collect, results are something you calculate, and then discussion is where you talk about, this didn't make sense, maybe I've got, you know, you know, something about this ought to be done again because blah, or you talk about it. And then the conclusion says, based on the results and my discussion, here's the answer. And instead of the one page memo, would just have the conclusion on it. On this one, you say, you say how you get to your conclusion. And then you want to have, um, as an appendix, first, what is it was asked? So that's like, uh, what was the assignment page? And then you look at the bottom and see if there's questions and make sure you answered those questions in the discussion or the probably in the discussion where you answer the question. Conclusion sums it up. And then what was assigned? What was the data? What are the calculations that support what's going on in your report? If you do a thing and you get to the results and you just say, see the appendix, then you really didn't report anything. The appendix is there to support the report, and I get that, you know, ah, it's too much trouble to actually put it in the body. So I'm just going to say, go look somewhere else for it, because it, I don't want to type that much. But, you know, if you have a whole bunch of data, you got, and there might be some things where we got a lot of data, we're gathering something every 10 milliseconds. I don't want to see 10 pages of stuff. Usually the graph tells a story. And you just take the graph, you know you can cut and paste Excel graphs into Word. Just cut and paste the graph and uh, save a tree. You don't necessarily need to put all 10,000 lines of Excel in the appendix. But the graph tells the story. And anyway, that's my story. So that's, that's how I like to see the, the labs, you know. Aside from whatever you write, back it up with what was the question, because that's another thing that can happen to you in the real world, especially if you have a, a boss who's um, pain. Uh, a pain. Yeah, a pain in the neck. Um, he'll ask you something, and you think you know what he wanted, and you go off, and he gave you a written, give me the answer to this, and you go give him the answer to that, and says, that's not what I wanted. And if you can show him the page that says, this is what you wanted, and say, oh, oh, well, that's not what I meant, as opposed to, you idiot, you know, you're putting you on, on you know, short term, whatever, because I want to fire you because you didn't give me the answer I wanted. Well, you didn't ask the question you wanted. And, you know, that's, it helps to be able to, to end that package. What was the question that you're trying to answer? It saves you. And there have been people that, um, uh, 
got out into the workplace and they were working for one or two years and they were hired into a job that wanted five years experience because the boss liked the way they did their reports with that sort of, you know, it has less, it's, it's a good thing. It sometimes pays off. So all the stuff that we're doing is not just to make your life miserable, even though it does succeed sometimes with that. So where are we here? We were um, talking last time, there's efficiency, and efficiencies are, um, they, can, they, they multiply. They don't add, they don't average. It's, if, if you have start off with a certain amount of energy and you only get 50% of it, uh, the energy out of the combustion, the rest goes up to exhaust, in the state of boiler. The turbine only uses 50% of its energy. Now you're down to 25% of what you started with being converted. And the generator is only 50% efficient. Now you, the whole chain of things isn't. This is 50, and this is 50, and this is 50. So it's all 50%. That's 50%? No. That's you got half and half and half, and you got like 12% efficient. So, um, and then there's effectiveness. Which isn't really about efficiency, but it's it's still how much energy do you put in? It's a different, you know, to get something done, you know, this shows different ways uh, you get it done. Uh, the light bulb. The last time we finished with this one, and um, the LEDs aren't really that much more efficient from what I see here than they, than a good fluorescent fixture is. But the difference is they can be small. They don't have to be a tube that's four feet long. So they they can be a lot more efficient because uh, they can be like spot lighting. Uh, you can use a much smaller power thing and still have brightness in like your car or something. Um, they are much more efficient than incandescent. Anyone know about incandescent light bulbs? It's got filament, right? And so if you look at them, they're a little pigtail round and round, and they just Run it's a resistor, tungsten's resistor, and when you run power through current through a resistor, it generates, it sucks up power and becomes hot, and it gets so hot that it's effectively white hot. And when you get to 316, we'll talk about in the heat transfer class. We can talk about the radiation and and, and things related to that. Uh, it converts about. 5% of the electrical energy into light and 95% of it into heat. Uh, whereas these, uh, you know, that's why the same brightness of a fluorescent will get you about a quarter of the power, which means they're maybe 20% efficient. If it's the same number of lumens. Again, you're measuring it in lumens. Um, So if you look at the boxes on these, electric cell these has 60 watt, and then underneath in really fine print, equivalent. And then it says 15 watts or 13 watts, something like that. But um, because people are so used to buying these inefficient guys, they have to, it's about the lumens, and nobody knows how many lumens they're talking about because they always bought them by the wattage of the bulb to get it to the price that they want. So, um, yeah. And then there's Water heaters. <clears throat> There's electric water heaters are real convenient to to install. You don't need a, a flue. You don't need gas. The fuel coming in. You don't need a flue going some out somewhere. Um, so, and they're also really efficient. What's so efficient about them? They are very good at wasting energy. They are 100% efficient at turning electricity into heat and heating the water because the elements inside the heater, and the only place for the heat to go is there or back out the other end. But if you insulate it well enough, then it all goes into the water. So if they're 100% efficient, um, why is this 90%? Well, how could they possibly be making losing efficiency. Any, uh, any takers on that one? Yeah. Is that because they're always on? 
they're always on, but they don't always turn on, but they're always hot. If you take your water heater at home and put a sweater on top of it and come back later in the day and put your hand under the sweater, everything around the sweater will be like almost room temperature. Under the sweater will be hot because the insulation is only just so good. And if the insulation was twice as thick, you'd have half as much heat loss, but it's always losing heat. There's a temperature difference between the inside and the outside. And depending on the insulation value of the, the insulation, there's always heat coming out of it. So the difference between a conventional and a high efficiency electric water heater, what do you suppose the difference is? You have probably bigger around, it's got more insulation. And even if it's a high efficiency one, if you then take an insulating blanket and put it around it, it's even higher efficiency. I, I, you know, I always put blankets around my water heaters. And anyone see that there's with a water with a blanket around it? Mm -hmm. it's, just, you know, fiberglass batting with plastic on the outside. All the hardware stores have them. And, you know, that's the difference between this and this. Easy to do, save a fair amount of money. If not here. <laughs> yeah, it depends on how much. Well, we pay. We we'll save like $2 a, like a year. Yeah, well, yeah, he's he's in like Chelan County, which like the giveaway power, they pay you to take it. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, here I'm paying eight and a half cents, and in town they're paying six and a half cents. So probably cost two fifty or three. There you go. Um, so why would anyone use one of these? These are terrible, right? What's the difference between a conventional and a high efficiency gas heater? It's all the same thing. Pretty much the same thing. But the issue with a gas water heater is it has a there, there's a flame in the bottom and it goes through a tube up through the middle, and that draft is always can always be there. So imagine there's no insulation there. If there was insulation there, it would heat the water. So if, if you can't cap that that flu, um, it's going to make for you're going to you're going to have fairly low efficiency. But here's the thing: if you actually look at the big picture, how much? How efficient is the power plant that's supplying your electricity? If it's a coal-fired or if it's a natural gas-fired or any of those things. Uh, not so much for hydro, not so much for wind, but if you're burning fuel, um, in a 411 class we go over this. Um, the actual efficiency, that's what we call or whatever, but that's the efficiency. <laughs> the efficiency of the electric system in the United States and most places for that matter, 34%. If that's the case, how efficient is the most efficient high efficiency electric actually overall? Very efficient. Three times one. Twenty-one. It's a chain. So it's 98% of 34. 36%. Oh no. 0.9 times 0.34. And yeah, 32% efficient. I see. Which means this is really twice as efficient in the whole system point of view. Which means one of these would actually have half the carbon footprint of one of these. And cost is and chances are you're paying, and one reason you're paying less is here, not only do they have to use that fuel, but they have to convert it and then they have to send it. And uh, you could be using the same fuel that if you're natural gas, you're going to pay a higher rate than they do, but, but they have all their overhead. And stuff, so the natural gas burning direct is actually, whereas this is less efficient, but the whole system part of it is more efficient. I don't. I have one. And um, what they, uh, the nice, so when he's talking about how efficient are uh, inline heaters that are on demand, as they call it, instead of a big tank, you have a heat exchanger and it heats up the water right now. And you can't really do that with electric because of the load. If, if you do the numbers on your 
however many kilojoules divided by however many minutes your shower was, you'd find that you, if you just ran uh, with the electric, you'd probably be doing like 400 amps of, of electric load or something like that, which is enough to blow your, your main circuit breaker in your house. Mm -hmm. That's one thing that the, these do, the tanks do, is they average out a load. You can demand that load and then it can catch up to it over the next hour. Um, the ones, the straight through ones, uh, running on propane or natural gas, it's a question of how efficient the conversion is, whether it's more or less efficient. But it could be, it could take this number up to, you know, 90%. And then everything's good. Uh, my wife hates ours because it's so far away from the kitchen sink. She has to turn on the kitchen sink and wait and wait and wait for, because the water starts, instead of coming out of the tank hot, it comes out cold and it, until the uh, heat exchanger brings it up to temperature, which takes an extra 20 seconds or something. So how much water are you wasting waiting for that hot water? That's why I wanted to put a little electric water heater underneath the sink. <laughs> but she said, we're not spending money on that. That's right. The boss said, but you pay the water. <laughs> well, we're on a well, so oh. there you go. <laughs> yeah. And it just waters the lawn. Well, it does waters the lawn until underneath. So you said so I we I did the just to find out the calculation of thirty four percent and the ninety four percent it's a thirty one percent and then if we do the sixty two percent on the thirty four percent it's about twenty one percent oh but we don't the the sixty two doesn't have this because it's not running on electricity you're running on the fuel directly dude so that's that's so what I was going to ask you you just I guess you you said something about the sixty two percent one it's Saves more. What was well, it called? So this, if you take your 94% times 34 or 90 or whatever, uh -huh. that becomes down like 31, close to 31%. This one is 62%. It's twice as efficient oh, okay. in the big picture. Okay, see so you know. Yeah. And that probably gets reflected in the price you pay for the electric, for the fuel, depending, except in Chelan County and Grant County where it's all hydro and yeah. What is it? Two cents or four cents or three cents? Yeah, it's like the cheapest in the nation. Yeah. yeah. And this cheapest is across East Greenwich is the cheapest. Huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, and actually that's why the, the cost of electricity from the hydro in this, this mid-Columbia region uh, in Quincy, which is uh, Grant County, they've located uh, Yahoo and Microsoft to have server farms there. BMW and SGL fibers put in a carbon fiber plant for all of the base, basic material. Making carbon fiber is energy intensive. And the I-series BMW basic material, not parts, but the actual carbon fiber is made in Moses Lake. Mm -hmm. Along with REC, um, a Norwegian solar uh, panel company makes the silicon for REC uh, solar panels worldwide is made in Moses Lake because again energy intensive and they can can say well it's all been made off of hydro great and so not only is it cheap but it's clean like green right and clean and all you have to do is find people who want to move to Moses Lake to work in your plant <laughs> <laughs> um, so here's an example problem for finding a, a system efficiency we're going to turn hydropower into electricity and what we know is we were able to test the generator and we know that it's 95% efficient in turning uh, mechanical shaft power into electrical power down the line. Uh, and we know that it has 1,862 kilowatts as the output. And when we're designing this thing and we know that we got 50 meters worth of Head on the lake. Is the 1862 after the 95% or before? No, that's uh, after. After 95? That's the, completely out. Okay. So the 95% happens here, and you got in, and you got that's the out. Um, and we're going to assume the kinetic energy when it comes out here, it just comes out, and we've gotten all of the energy out of the water. Yeah. So your 5% loss in the generator would just be from heat and friction, right? That's like friction generally. Bearing friction and um, also, um, ohmic lo uh, resistance losses in the wires. Oh, yeah. Because there's, it's, yeah, it's copper, and it has a little bit of resistance, and when you add all that stuff up, 
And there's being like magnetic field imperfection things that will show up. How will that show up? Maybe if you have something that's 100% efficient, you convert from one form to basically it shows up as heat. Yeah. And so you have to cool your engine, you have to cool the generator probably with maybe it's water cooling if it's big enough or air cooling. Um, all the inefficiencies end up being turning into heat. Yeah. Is is sound considered an energy form? Of yeah. Okay, so sound and heat. And sound is part of it. Usually that's it might be loud, but it's it's not the largest the is largest it, place where the energy goes. Technically, if you were running theoretically at one hundred percent efficiency, it would be quiet and heat, and there'd be no heat exchanger. Right. I mean, and you know, you get in one of these power plants, and they're loud, but it's not loud like you know, rock band with hundred watt amplifiers. And we're talking megawatts. Of, you know, I mean, a hundred watt amplifier is screaming. Use it right. Um, and this is a picture, by the way, of an old. Uh, uh, in California, there is a. Um, there's a mining town called Bodie on the east side of the Sierra. And somewhere here I've got. And uh, that was a power plant from. Uh, What they call Pelton Needle. You see some cups on there. And somewhere here I have a Pelton Needle. They use in, oh well, I'll find it later. Maybe. Um, oh well. Uh, Pelton Needle. Takes a jet of water, and these are the nozzles for the water, and they look like a big um, garden nozzle, and it shoots into these cups, and the cups split the water and shoot it back out the other way. And this had a this generator had a felt wheel on either side, and then you can change the nozzle for the flow to, to match the speed that you need and so forth. But this was used uh, for the power for Bodhi. Um, in like 1860, maybe 1865, or you know, way before 1900. One of the earliest ones. So anyway, I thought I'd include that picture. Uh, that could be what's going on here. What was its efficiency? The efficiency of that was. I have no idea. <laughs> Probably pretty good though. Really? Yeah. They're um, the Pelton wheel is. is is interesting in that if you get it going such that the speed of the cup is half the speed of the nozzle, or, or the water coming out of the nozzle is twice as fast as the cup, it approaches the cup, it's chasing the cup, and when it turns around in the cup, it leaves at the same speed it entered. But the speed that it approaches the cup is, anyway, long story short, if you think about it, this is going you know, 10 feet per second, and the water's coming in at 20, it's going to approach it at, it's chasing it at 10 feet per second. When it turns around, it leaves at 10 feet per second, but the cup's moving all at 10 feet per second. All your kinetic energy is. Well, it, yeah. You're, you're able to capture a change in momentum. The change in momentum is, is yeah, so they're, they're pretty good. There is, there are modern monkeys. This isn't just an antique thing. Uh, Packwood has, uh, which is on the slope of Mount Rainier, um, there's a generating station in Packwood that uses it too. And what these are good for is if you have high head, like 1,000 foot, high pressure uh, and low flow. Don't have a lot of water, but you have a lot of elevation. So on Mount Rainier, there's Packwood Lake, and that drops down uh, a long ways. That's where these work. They don't work so well in a dam. Uh, low head dam, they have uh, propellers, or they'll have 
Francis turbines, which are a whole different ball game. We'll, you'll see those in, in fluids. Um, but these work really well for low flow, high pressure, because that high pressure makes that kinetic energy. Um, so what do we know about this? 5,000 kilograms per second. So the is it 1862 the out the energy out? Yes. Okay. That's the electrical. Okay. And do we need to change? Do we need to change the the 5,000 uh, kilograms per second? Yeah. No. Do, we need, do we need to convert that into kilojoules? No. Okay. Because that's a kilogram. That's a mass, not an energy. Okay. It's not a kilojoule. Um, but what we do have to do, uh, and this is an, an, an illustration of not just starting to put numbers in an equation and then get down a blind alley, but develop the algebra before you put numbers in. Because sometimes things simplify. So we need to find out, we have the out, we need to find out the in and the change in the system. Yeah. So here's, I've already started setting it up. Okay. And what we know from stuff we've been talking about I want to find the system efficiency, and that would be the power in versus power out, all of the, the, the generator plus the hydro turbine efficiency bundled together. And then with that, and knowing the one part of it, we can back out what the turbine efficiency is for this all to be true. Um, so what they told us, the mass flow rate is 5,000 kilogram per second. They didn't tell us temperature. We'd have to assume a temperature in order to get a density. And um, you know, volume flow rate isn't a mass flow rate. But you know, how big is this really? 5,000 kilograms per second. That's 5,000 liters, or I mean, approximately. It would be on the order of, depending on density, five cubic meters per second, because there's a thousand liters in a cubic meter. There's about a kilogram in a liter, which means one of those tanks back there, the big white tank, that's about a cubic meter. It'd be five of those a second. So imagine five of those stacked up in one second. That's how much water's going through this turbine. It's crazy. I, I yeah. visit the. Uh... Oh, the, the, I went to the uh, um, Chilean, one of the uh, rock, Rocky Reach. Rock, rock, Rocky Reach. Yeah. I went through them underneath and all that. Yeah, when it's you go insane. in the, the dam insane. there, it's just. It's crazy. I'm everything's fast. Just, just real low rumble. Those turbines don't turn all that fast. They're going like 85 RPM, which is almost, you know, it's like one and a half rotations a second. They're only going that fast. You know, 1,001. They're turning about like that. And they're putting out, you know, bazillion watts each, and there's like 10 or 20 of them lined up. It's huge. Um, so how do we get there? The power. So we know the power out is. Is that a change in power that you have there? Power equal change in power. Uh, no, change in pressure. Change in pressure. So hey, there's a low pressure here and a high pressure there, and the difference between them is 50 meters worth of water. And 50 meters worth of water will give us a certain pressure. Now we can calculate the pressure, rho GH, density. You know, something that's more dense will have higher pressure. Um, rho G, gravity, H, height of the fluid. We can calculate the pressure, and then we could also take the mass flow rate and, and assume a density at a certain temperature and come up with a number for the volume flow. Is that what that is? Volume flow? A volume flow rate. When I put a dot over it, that means this would be, instead of gallons, that would be volume. Gallons per minute is the dot. In math, they use a dot for like, you know, instead of dm dt, you just say m dot, right? So when I'm using dots, that means how fast. So this would be like gallons per minute, cubic, or, you know, cubic meters per second. But we don't have cubic meters. So, Rather than putting all those numbers together, which would not be wrong, that would work. You know, density is mass per unit volume. 
which means volume solve for volume. Volume is mass over density. But if, if the volume is how fast, then some, you can't have density as how fast, but you can have mass as how fast, kilograms per second. So the volume flow rate is going to be m dot divided by density. So is it 5,000? So we can, yeah, but we're not putting the numbers in yet. Okay. We can take this and substitute in here. And now let's look at what pressure is. Pressure, a change in pressure is a, which is really, when you talk pressure, it's really about the change between some datum and wherever the high point is. The change in pressure between the high and the low, between the two sides of the pump, or the turbine, is the density again makes a difference, gravity is what pulls it down, and a change in height, in this case, 50 meters. And now let's substitute this into there. With this substitution of this for this and that for that, we get this. Anyone? Is there anything that could cancel out here? P. The, yeah, the P. The pressure. Uh, it's actually rho. Density, sorry, because we don't yeah. know what they are anyway. Yeah, and we didn't know what density was, but it turns out it don't matter. <laughs> cancel. We do know. What gravity is, 9.8 lines. Yeah, we know. Speaking. So now we've got G times H times M dot. We've got all that information. 9.81 meters per second squared. Um, and this is the inlet power. This is the power into the, the water power into the system that has to be converted by the turbine. Uh, it's not going to be able to convert it all. How much? We're going to find out. And we got 50 meters. And we got 5,000 kilograms per second. Cancel the, the meters, the seconds. Well, hang on. We're going to do um, Ooh, one do Newton meter. Oops. We're going to have two conversions. One Newton meter is one kilogram meter squared per second squared because a Newton is a kilogram meter per second squared. And we multiply it times a meter, we got meters squared. And um, if we, what if we, you know, the 50 meters in the middle? We can't cancel that with the meter on the. Yeah. We Say can't. Again. I was just just thinking. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, correct me. Uh, the 50 meters. I can't cancel that meter with the meter for the gravity, and then cancel the like. Probably. Let's let's see what. What we if get. I cancel also the kilogram? Sorry, the second man <laughs> with the second from the gravity also. Yeah, that's something like that's going to happen. But let's let's just let's keep all let's keep it all let's let's group it here. Um, so what do we get? 50 times 5,000 times, that's about 10 times 25 is 250, that's a bunch. <coughs> and I'll do the units. So, oh, wow. Do you want, do you want in scientific notation or? Um, yeah, give me like three digits and then. 2.45 times 10 to the 6. Okay, and now I'm going to say one Newton is one kilogram meter per second squared. Um, that takes care of some of this stuff. One joule is one Newton meter. So Newtons cancel and the other meter cancels. We're left with Joules per second, and I'll say one watt is one joule per second. Okay, so let me two, four, five, ten, six. And seconds cancel, joules cancel. We end up with um, 2.45. 
2450 and I'm going to take 3 out of this I took out of this 10 to the 6th, I moved this three decimal places and then I put a kilo in there and that's what we got is 2450 kilowatts. I should say, actually the best way to deal with that is to say this. One kilowatt is 1000. I should do that like that. I was skipping a step on that. So the first one, the first conversion you have there, plus three is what, kil, kilograms? Um, it turned in newters, uh, newton is a kilogram meter per second. Before that one, you just, oh, you just put all the units together. I just put the units together. Okay. I just took off, <coughs> I had a kilogram, and then a meter, and a meter, and there's a meter squared, and a second, second, and then a second, so that second's cubed. Okay. I just put them all together. And, and then, then I said one newton is a kilogram, one newton is a meter per second squared. It's a kilogram. And a joule is a newton meter, and a kilowatt is a thousand joules per joule second. Joule newton meter. And one kilowatt. It's a thousand joules. Is that what the last one? Yeah, one thousand joules per second. Per second. A joule per second is a watt. Okay. So. Questions? I, I, I hear the, you know, where did you get that? What's the, what are you doing? What happened? Where are you going to get that? Where's, where's the hell on that? Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Second. Yeah. Second. Yeah. Second. Yeah. Second. Yeah. Where's the meter, 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 meter? And then you have three. Let's see. Yeah, this is all of it. Basic definition of density and power, and then or pressure, power and pressure and density. Well, this is the flow rate. So the dot means a rate, which means per second, per minute, whenever there's going to be time involved. Gallons per minute. Change in speed, change in pressure. Change in pressure. Okay. Meaning the difference in pressure from the outlet to the inlet. Or, you know, we can say rho GH is the pressure. Well, I got, if I have a cup of water right here, we're at 1,600 feet elevation. Does that mean that the pressure in the cup of water is 1,600 feet times rho GH? No. It's, it's, what's the difference? It's how deep is the water in the cup? So it's like from 1,600 feet to 1,600.2 feet or something. The difference is where the pressure comes from. So by, you're saying difference because we're assuming that it's zero energy when it comes out? Yeah. So and we're just assuming there, all of it's going to not, not about zero energy as much as zero reference. There's, there's a reference zero. And in my point, it comes out. Yeah, where it comes out, we're calling that zero. and. It's 50 feet higher. Oh, okay. So a lot of times we're going to find that a lot in thermodynamics. Rather than dealing with what's the elevation of you know 1600 feet elevation and this is to 1605 feet, so we got to subtract those. Why don't we just call it five feet? There's a lot of that going on uh, in your steam tables. Zero isn't it's absolute zero temperature. Uh, this, when we get to talking about properties, zero is going to be set at, for steam, it's ice, water, literally water that just turned to liquid. There's not going to be any temperature lower than that in the steam power plant. When you talk about refrigeration, they have to pick, well, let's take the lowest temperature, R134 is, I think, I don't know, there's a place where they call it zero, and it's sort of an arbitrary reference, and then everything from there is built from that zero, but it's not, not absolute zero, it's not even freezing, it's like, I don't know why they picked that, that particular point other than maybe nobody ever freezes anything closer, lower than that using R134, something like that. Generally are all those zeros at 1 ATM? Yeah, usually we're going to talk in terms of 
standard. Because that's the other thing, you know, 50 foot head plus atmospheric pressure in the real world. Yeah. And on the outlet, it's, you know, zero elevation plus atmospheric pressure, but atmospheric pressure will wash out if it's acting on both sides. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's 50 feet height, it's going to give you a little bit. That's how altimeters work, they measure pressure. As you go up, the pressure gets less. And there is a difference in atmospheric pressure in the 50 feet, but it's probably way beyond the precision of the numbers you're using. It's negligible to the system. Yeah, it's real, but ignorable. So the basic question is the amount of mechanical power that the water has available to the turbine. That's great. And for the whole system, I get um, power out divided by power in. So my power out is 1862 kilowatts. My power <laughs> in is 2450 kilowatts. And kilowatts cancel, we end up with a Fraction somewhere around, yeah, I was going to say 75%. So, uh, since we have four digits on all this stuff, well, the 50 meters is really only good for two digits. We're pushing our luck, but yeah, seven, 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 six. yeah six. I got 76% on the dot. Okay, good. 0.760, that means it's on the dot, well, within three digits. Which means, can we now figure out what the efficiency of the turbine is without ever measuring it? it had, first, it had to go through the turbine and make mechanical power. So what was the question, sir? What is the turbine efficiency of turning water power into shaft power? Um, so the, the turbine times the generator gives me my total which means now I know what the generator efficiency was because they checked that in the factory. I can say efficiency of the turbine. Is it going to be more or less efficient than, than our system? It should be a little bit more because it's got another thing in its chain. So it's going to be, take the system, divide it by generator. And we get um, 0 0.760 divided by 0 0.95, 20. 0 0.80, and probably double O's. So now 80%. it's 80% efficient at turning water power into shaft power, torque times RPM in this example. So there's a couple things going on with this example, uh, one of which is don't throw numbers into stuff until you've, you've messed with the, uh, what you know and, and you know it simplifies your life. We didn't have to go do a calculation for pressure and one for density, didn't have to look up density, didn't have to calculate pressure and uh, flow, volume flow rate, all, it turned out that we didn't, it simplified it. And that helps in your homework, too. The other thing was watch your units. Make sure they're making sense before you start. Even if you do have the formula, I do it all the time. Get something upside down because I'm just going too fast. And you'll end up with, with you know, joule time seconds instead of joule divided by seconds. And uh, what's this mean? Well, it means you made a, it's not what you expect. And you probably have something upside down. And it'll help you find what's upside down. So simplify your formulas, check your units before you put numbers in, and life is good. So it's, the hardest part, at least for me, is coming with all the conversions that you did. Yeah, yeah. And Newton is the one where you're going and then Joe's are on it. And yeah, you get more familiar. You're able to get all that stored to cancel it now and get the right answer. Right, right. I just ignore that. <laughs> but you have, you want all the units so you can actually yeah. put it in.